live with what? an episode Mike. of what's that i'm jack now i thought my yep. name was soku yeah you're jack and take it away here's johnny <laughs> all right sorry a little bit of a. Uh... oh man i forgot the name of the movie now uh That's, the, uh, the shining, shining. the yeah. shining reference uh so welcome uh peers colleagues friends admirers haters Countrymen. lovers trolls fancy men and women and mm -hmm. and non gender non binary gender fancy people as well. You're all welcome. Yep. Um, it's not exclusive here at all. Exactly inclusive. We are an inclusive. Um, so this is an episode of Dear Sensei. Um, basically, Adam and I like our uh, our hobby. Some people like hunt. Some people fish. Some people uh, make model ships. Adam, actually, you make you make little you paint little model figurine, right? Like little Star I Wars figures. That's one of the many things I do. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so some people have hobbies like that. Uh, Adam and I's hobby is to go on Facebook and answer questions by coaches. And so we thought, hey, what if we like did that as like a real thing? And instead of just waiting for people to ask good questions, we would ask them to ask good questions and then create a space to answer them. And so that's the purpose of it. Um, that, and we have like also this like super kind of secret ulterior motive, which is that we both run programs for coaches that are really, really incredible and actually do a lot of the stuff the, all the other programs promise to do then don't actually deliver on and uh adams is called forging the steel it starts in september they got a few had a few more spots left right yeah that's correct cool and uh you they should just reach out to you if they're interested in that yeah yes directly to me direct directly carrier pigeon um if you if you bury an acorn in the woods and call adam's name he'll also get the message so that's, um, that's, that's the most indirect direct way but that way will work yeah and then uh, I run a program with Christina Salerno, and this time uh, Dave Burns called the Samurai Coaching Dojo. We've got one dojo that's sold out, so we only have one group left. Huzzah! One, one coaching dojo, and, and there's a couple spots in the sales dojo that are open as well. So if you're interested in that, we'll put a, a link to apply in the bottom. And we'll tell you more about that at the, at the end, but let's, let's get right down to business, Adam. Yeah. First, I just want to – I've got uh, an Obi-Wan Kenobi miniature here. Look at this guy. Not got a lick of paint on him, the poor man. So – He'll get sorted he's pure, soon. He's pure force right now. He's just pure force. He's a force ghost. Yeah, actually, maybe force he's ghost. done. That's exactly That's as he's it. meant to be. That's how I paint hey. miniatures. It's the Zen way. It's, <laughs> the miniatures are whole and complete, lacking nothing when I get them. Hey there, Barati. I think I'm saying your name right. So, uh, Toku, shall we just dive in? I'll read off this first question. Let's do it. Excellent. And uh, oh, we should say, guys, like we love live questions. So if you have a question as we're going through here, something shows up for you, bring it. It's way more fun for us to be interactive than for us to just be speaking at a screen with no one saying anything. So, Brody, you're already winning, having said hello. So good. So uh, our first question here is it's a long it's a longy. I'm curious about the underlying framework for real versus resistance based desires. I'm going to put that, I'm going to put this up here. Uh, show. Using the magic of the internet. Ha. What is a real desire and what is resistance and what do those concepts mean? And then some elaboration. I'm not sure I have a very good answer for this myself. And it seems really important because I noticed that I sort of automatically default to a preference for realness over resistance. What's real is good and resistance is a problem to be solved or gotten past. I think this matters to me because how I hold realness and resistance are going to affect how I work with whatever I perceive to be there. Um, we can skip this. Yeah, we'll just skip this last paragraph. I just yeah. want to say this is from Resistance. That's how you you styled this one, Toku. Not your best uh, Dear Sensei pun, I don't think. Not my, my best stance versus resist stance. <laughs> hey Chrissy just crowbar it in there just crowbar it in there <laughs> do you want to take the first swing at this Toku and then I'll uh I'll follow up yeah um so this part of what prompted this question is I posted a question one of the things I do every day in the dojo is I post qu questions for coaches to consider um because I'm a coach like asking questions coaches like answering questions um and so this came from a question of if a client how can you tell if a client's desire for authenticity is real, like they have a real desire to be authentic versus resistance. Because something that shows up for me a lot when I'm coaching clients is they'll, they'll say, well, I don't want to do something because I'm afraid it's not going to work, or I don't want to do something because I feel like it would be inauthentic. And so part of my work is to discern, well, is that really what's in the way? Or is that, is that survival mechanism? Is that story? Is that interpretation about what's going to happen? 
showing up in the in the costume of authenticity or um, it's not going to, you know, effectiveness or now is not the right time or I just need to do these things first because resistance love resistance is like like Halloween would be resistance's favorite holiday because it just loves to show up in costumes. And so um, I feel like this is a double-edged sword because the, the des- there's always a part of the desire that is real, right? I don't think you actually can say like, these desires are real, these are desires are BS. There's always a part of desire that's real, right? And it's sort of like, like, like in a way, like when you wear a costume, like there is a part of you that becomes that person in the costume, right? Otherwise people wouldn't put on costumes superheroes wouldn't wear a cape. There, there is a, a transformation that happens when we put on the costume of something else. And so part of that desire is real. People do want to be authentic. People do want to do things that are effective. People, your clients do want to do things that, you know, they do need to do those things that are important. But the question is, 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 is like, hey, I've actually looked at this. I'm clear about what's the resistance. I'm clear about the parts of this that are resistance and the parts of this that are real desire. And I'm willing to here's how I'm going to fulfill that desire and still take action. Or am I just going to put this real desire in the way of taking action? And so for me, it's not about like what's real and what's not real. It's about, okay, what parts of this are real and how can I honor the voice or the part that's bringing something that's real while also like not falling into the story, the resistance, the interpretation the client is bringing that basically comes down to, I'm not going to do the thing that I'm scared of, afraid of, unsure about will threaten my old way of being. Mm. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, even the notion of real versus resistance can be a bit challenging because to your point, right? Like real, oh, it's much better toku. <laughs> and we get to see all of you. Um, so I would call it kind of like, which what we're really trying to distinguish is, is a fear-based action from fear action to avoid fear or whatever from action, from like our deep, our greatness, our deepest self, our essence, our, our deepest truth. Um, and so first, I think exactly to what resist stance, our, our, our question asker has said is that like there, there actually isn't a, it's fine to choose from fear. And as coaches, part of the way we can get stuck. I certainly have this is like, Ah, my survival mechanism's wrong. I should not be choosing choices from fear. I should always be stepping into the possibility and always be leaning more into my deepest purpose and my deepest heart. But that's just not really realistic. It's a great place to aspire to be, but like I don't I don't even know if that's a great place to aspire to be as I say that. And I think that it's much we just do a disservice to people when we hold things that way, because if you as coach are holding it that way, they're going to feel that energetically, if nothing else, it's going to come through in the transmission. And so the first step is for us to bring this to our coaches to like do some work around this so we can actually hold space for us to just be human. Mm. I remember one of the first um, places I got slapped with this was I was bringing a coaching request to my coach saying like, ah, how do I be with my wife's victimhood? And uh, she said, well, that's such an interesting request, Adam, because I see you playing a victim so often. Of course, I was like, screw you. But that was the first step is me to just see like, oh, I've got victimhood and I have so much resistance to letting myself be a victim that it's kind of in my blind spot. I I have to set it aside. I can't see it. I can't let myself have it, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's the first thing is just for us to, to get coached around our relationship to coming from fear. And to actually have that be okay. Sometimes we need to choose that. And sometimes we really need to hold the space for our clients to choose that. Maybe they have to choose with consciousness from fear five times before they're ready to choose the other way. So that's foundation. Um, I would say that the way that the the challenge here to your point about Halloween and, and our ego wearing masks is that yesterday's breakthrough will become today's fear-based action. Meaning like I can have this huge shift in my life because I made this change, but now that's become my new rule that I follow. And now that's what allows me to stay safe. And so um, I think there's the, the challenge as coach is for us to be able to see kind of like what's the overall pattern if you just drop in to the very first conversation and the third sentence someone says, and you're telling them that that, that seems like it's fear-based, 
maybe you need to spend a little bit more time with the people and just get it. And we want to get a sense of like what, for some people, well-being can be like really a big edge for them to lean into. And for other people, that's the thing that they put in the way of everything they want to do. I'm not ready to do it because I'm just too tired. I need to get my health back. I need to blah, 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 blah. So that's the main question I would be looking into is like, what's the underlying pattern that I notice happens with my client? Can I distinguish that? Which is really like, can I get up from the weeds so I can see the greater picture? How does this client tend to get stuck? How do they tend to get in their way? I have one more thing on this, which is, how am I doing, Toku? Am I talking too much? Am I good? Uh, can you make it, can you make it brief? Can you Obi-Wan it? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, authenticity as a trap, uh, sorry, authenticity as a concept is a bit of a trap because what feels authentic right now is often what feels good and what is known. And often our getting to our deeper truth will, will often feel inauthentic as we practice something new. Beautiful. The force is cool. strong with this one. <laughs> hey, Allison. Hey, Callum. You got the next question for us, Toby? I do. I do actually. I, well, you, you you pointed to it, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of skip ahead a couple questions to a question that uh, the Robert Gullickson asked on our in the Dojo Facebook group. Um, he was curious if we could talk about um, the balance between meeting clients where they are versus mm -hmm. eliciting their greatness. Their greatness. Hmm. That is such a good question, and um, definitely one I struggle with because I'm not so good at meeting me where I'm at. I kind of hold this ideal, like, oh, I was just referencing it. Like I should always be choosing from love and never from fear. So <laughs> I think part of this is, again, a lot of our answers will probably come back to this, right? Like doing our own work and, and taking this on. And then it's the dance, right? Like we can teach you steps for a dance, but ultimately it's the music and what your partner is feeling and how your partner is being with you that dictates how the dance progresses, even moment to moment. And so for me, so much of this is as soon as I'm like, oh, here's the right way to, to uh, be with this client. Like what they need right now is this because I've been giving them the other thing for the last five days, I'm screwed. The better question is like, where is this person in the moment? Do they feel like I can be a powerful stand and bring more rigor with, with my being to them? Or do they feel like they need more love and they're really struggling? Mm. I love that. Yeah, I guess for me, it's, there's, um, in Zen, we talk about these kind of two sides of reality, one side being the relative world, which is the world of like cars and cable television. And then the other one being the side of the absolute where everything's whole and complete, lacking nothing, right? You're already a Buddha. Everything's great. And uh, the answer actually I gave to the post was um, your job is to always be present with your client's greatness and always remember that their greatness is always present. I'm going to say that one more time. So your job is to always be present with your client's greatness and remember that their greatness is always present. So from one perspective, from the perspective of the absolute, like there is no difference between being with a client where they're at and eliciting their greatness, right? So one way to elicit greatness is to really mm. meet them and honor them where they're at because this moment, this, this survival mechanism, this imperfect way of showing up right now is a manifestation of their greatness. It is an expression of their greatness. And so um, it's a bit, from that perspective, it's a bit of a misnomer. But I think it's, it's really important. I think one of the things that makes some... Um, coaching so special or different than other things that exist in the world is that the, and this is my philosophy, which is that the coach is taking the stance of, I will always see your greatness, no matter how you show up. And for most people, like we see their, like our, well, the way most people relate to each other is I'll see your greatness if you show up this way. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, if you come home and bring me flowers, you're an amazing husband, you're romantic, you're awesome, you're sexy. And if you come home and you haven't showered, you're gross, lazy slob, right? Like, I don't want to be anything around. So it's very conditional, right? I'm not seeing the perfect person in you if it doesn't show up that way. And the coach's stance is like, it doesn't, you, you could show up being like, I'm amazing. I signed a hundred clients. I'm making millions of dollars and I see your greatness. Or I can show and be like, nothing's working. My life sucks. I hate you. I hate myself. I hate ducks for some reason. And, and I'm like, great that's awesome. And your greatness is still here. And then you'll be like, you know, F you Toku. And I'm like, cool. That's part of your greatness too. So that's part of what makes coaching so amazing is you're always taking that stance. 
And then on the other side of this, there is this part of like, there's going to be as coach, you're going to see possibility that is really beyond what your client can be within the moment. And there is a little bit of the art of holding that goal to them and learning how to dribble it back to them and kind of like say, hey, here's the gold, here's the gold, here's the gold. And then one day they'll go like, oh my God, there's gold here. And you're kind of like, duh, duh. like I've been showing <laughs> it to you for months. But, but I recently had a client go through this where they actually had a breakdown and like then started to see their gold. And it was just like, I was almost in tears on the call because when, when they do it, when they kind of do it themselves and you're there with them and you've seen it all along, but they're in that process of realizing it, like, man, that's why I do this coaching thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've got to read this, this comment, Katie. I love this so much. This is, you don't know how much of an honor it is to read this. So Katie says, I have to tell you this. My son listens slash watches my learning over my shoulder and just said, Oh, is it those two mom? They're my favorite coaches. So Katie, <laughs> we love your son, son, whatever your name is. You're awesome. Thank you for that. That is delightful to read. Um, let's go to, Oh, I'm going to get his name wrong now. He correct. It's, Caleb. I'm pretty certain it's Caleb's question. Uh, right. So he says, Toka, I was just reading your post on five uncomfortable truths. You mentioned one thing in there about being cautious about referrals. A couple of months back, I experienced some exponential growth in my business. I'm seeing the proof of the effect and the value of my coaching, but I found that I'm cautious with asking about referrals. It feels as if I'm playing a guessing game on when the right time is laughing out loud. What would you guys suggest? Your turn first. I think it's my turn first. Yeah, you. So we get to yeah. basically we get to go twice in a row. Oh, I love this. This, this is great. Yeah. Um, so what I would suggest is start asking for referrals. Next question, please. No. I, <laughs> uh, so you know, I, I did. I posted something recently on Facebook. A post I said, like, I'm a bad leader, right? And it's interesting. Like this thing that we often we we don't want to be bad at things. I mean, it has a lot to do with our school system, right? And the way we're raised, and we're taught that we should only do things we're good at. And I could, you know, rail on for hours about that. But basically, we just don't want to be bad at things. And the truth is, is like you're probably you might be bad at asking for referrals at first. You're probably going to ask at the wrong time. People are probably not going to give you referrals. Like that, all that stuff is going to happen. So, you know, there is no right time. And there is a right time. And the only way you're going to figure it out is by asking a bunch and learning, right? So I mean, kind of annoyingly, I'm basically like, you should go practice it, right? But that's the truth. Um, the, the one thing I will say kind of, and this is much more tactical and less coachy, is that when you think about referrals, the way I, I, I've come to realize the way most people are asked for referrals isn't very enrolling, right? It would be like trying to get someone to go to a movie who has like never been to the movies and doesn't know what kind of movies they like. And then you kind of blurt everything about how film and cameras work and then ask, and then the movie that, and then try to explain Marvel universe to them and then ask them to come to the movies. That's not going to work. Right. So like the way people decide they like going to the movies is they hear about movies, they watch previews, they are aware that other people are going to the movies, that they're having a good time. And eventually after that experience, they go try it themselves and like, wow, the movies are great. And then they go to more movies, right? There's this, um, it's actually this thing called the product life cycle that, people are gonna go through and your referrals are no different, right? So when you're asking for referrals, don't just like, at first just go ask, but also think about like, if it were for me, like what would be enrolling for me if I was asking for a referral? Like what, what is the mission you're up to as a coach that makes me excited to share what you're doing? Where's the, where is this person's resistance to giving referrals? How do you make it easy on them? Like really think about the process. And I wouldn't start there. I wouldn't analyze for two years and then go do it. I would start doing that. But as you're doing it, start to develop for yourself a model of like, when, like, when are you most excited to give referrals? So for example, now when my clients have big like ahas and they sign clients and great things happen, I ask them for referrals right then. Because the truth is, it's way easier to give a referral when you're excited about it. So part of this is just action and practice. And part of this is really thinking, using all of those coaching skills of like, thinking and feeling into and being creative and empathetic about who your clients are and what inspires them in the world. And then using that to give them an opportunity to, to give a referral in a way that feels really powerful and good and inspired. Like even giving a referral to your coaching could be a tool for transformation, a powerful modeling of leadership and a powerful modeling of what it means to ask for what you want world. Really good question. I wish I had a better answer than the one I'm going to give, which will be two parts. So the first part is 
I just want to reiterate what you said, Toku, which is practice. So what most people do, and especially coaches, because we're in the coaching world, is we do what's basically mental masturbation, where we're like, ah, I'm scared to ask for referrals. I just need more conversation with my coach. I just got to get coached on this. I got to create a new mindset. And yeah, maybe you do need a new context to come from, but you still have to go and do the scary thing, which is asking for a referral. So if you're trying to bypass feeling afraid or being in your fear through mindset work, that's masturbation. I assert. That's my assertion. So definitely practice it in the face of your caution because then we have data on which to actually coach. Like if someone comes to me and they say, I've asked for seven referrals and it's not working. Great. We can work with that. Whereas if they come to me and say, I've asked for zero referrals, I'm terrified to do so. How do I get over this? What I would be more inclined to support them with is setting up a structure. So some kind of container that has them actually take the steps they're afraid to do. Do you need to have an accountability partner? Do you need to have some consequence on the line? Do you need to have a reward? People like to set up the reward rather than the consequence because the reward, if you don't do the thing you say you're going to do, you just don't get the reward. You don't have to pay any price for it. So usually consequence is the more powerful structure there. So that's the first part. Practice, 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 practice. We cannot emphasize this enough, which is why both of our programs have a lot of practice-based work in it. Getting you into practice is what actually allows the coaching to then kind of take hold and, and have traction. So that's part one. Part two, I'll say I have tried... First, I actually just really want to connect and relate with... Who asked this? This was Caleb. Dude, I so oh, relate Caleb, to this. Sorry. Um. I've struggled with asking for referrals myself. I have fear about it. I feel needy, awkward, et cetera. And I've done a lot of acting in the face of that. And my experience is that my referrals tend to come not from me asking, although I think it's important to ask even though, but they tend to come from people where I've done really great work. And what I notice is that when I serve someone, really powerfully without any agenda and then give them full like space and permission to just go and do whatever they want. Like at the end of the conversation, I say, so what would serve you from here? Do you want to talk again? Do you want to hear what it's like to work with me? Do you want me to leave you here? Do you want me to just never talk to you ever again? Um, The more I do that in the world, the more people start to tell other people about me. So I do not want you to take this as like advice that you shouldn't be asking for referrals because the only way I've gotten to this side of things is by going through my fears about asking for referrals. So it's a bit of both. I find some people will love to refer people to you and some people doesn't matter, especially my people, because we tend to not love intimacy and it's an intimate thing to refer someone. Um, You can serve us for the rest of our life and we probably won't refer someone to you. And so the powerful thing is getting over their response and just being clear on yourself and the value that you provide and a willingness to share it with people. And that, from that place, it's like asking for a referral is really no different than offering someone some of your time if you think you could really support them with something. They both come from this clean place of like, hey, I've got value and I'm happy to share it as a gift. Mm. One last turbo thing on this, which is Steve Chandler invited me once to say, Adam, one way you can present it, be careful about having ways of doing things, but one way was to give it to your clients like, look, that person you mentioned a couple of times in a row in our last few conversations, I would love to support them if you'd like that. It's my gift to them from you. You, I'm giving you permission and the ability to gift away some of my time. So you don't have to do anything with that, but I want you to know if you have people that you love, and that you want to give them some of this juicy stuff that you're getting, it's yours to give. And that really empowers it with a person. It lets them be free to do whatever they want. So that's one way you can kind of work with it. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have one of two questions. One's a little bit more fun and wild, and one's a little bit more serious. What are you feeling like, Adam? Uh, let's go fun and wild first. Okay. So this is- uh, Hold on, hold on. From- Check this out. It's fun and wild time, and we spelled it with a Y. It's crazy. Right. I also wanted to say, I, I saw some people commenting, Karen, Aaron, Allison Crow. I think Tony Benici's on here. 
because we have our, our home. Some people we love. We love you guys. So welcome. Um, okay, so this is uh, apparently stolen from John Lee Dumas. Okay, so let's say the matrix has reset and you have to start over as a nuke, as a coach. So nobody knows you, but you have all of your current knowledge and experience. You have nothing but a laptop and $500. What would you do in the first seven days? Oh, this one's really easy for me. Um, for seven days? For seven days. I would, um, fig- uh, like, I'm assuming that I still know what I enjoy doing. I still like doing stuff. So I would do those yeah, the things. the world is white, but you're, but you're still in you're I'm still, still here. Yeah, I'm genre, yeah. genre savvy, if you like. So I would just go and do all the stuff that I love doing. I would go to the events that I find fun and enjoyable where there's people at. And I would talk and connect with those people without any agenda whatsoever. And I would just be super curious about who they are, what they're up to in their life, and whatever like kind of comes forward to me as I'm with someone, I would, I would share that question. Like, wow, it's fascinating. You seem like you've got it all figured out. That's amazing. Is that really true? Or like, do you even struggle or tell me more about this scotch that we're drinking? I love scotch. And it seems like you do too. What else do you do that I might love or whatever? So that's all I would spend those seven days doing. I love that. Um, I would definitely build a website I would definitely, the first thing I would build, I'd build a website that might take the whole seven days. I would, I would make sure I set up a Facebook page and make sure the pictures were really good, but not share it with anyone. That's where I would start. Uh, what about your business cards? (laughs) I would make sure sure I go on Moo. I'd spend most of those seven days deciding whether to use Moo cards or print Vista, either what I care what it's called. The other one that's a little bit cheaper. And yeah, I would, and I would make sure I get a really good profile picture. Um, (laughs) I mean, the reason why I'm joking is I would basically do the same thing, the, the same thing Adam would do. I, I mean, I think the only thing that, that I would do differently is I tend to be less of a purist on no agenda. I actually, I have this whole thing called like the, was the deer and the wolf. I've called that a bunch of, you know, the, the deer and the lion. So there's one part of you that should be completely agendaless and open, but there's another part of you that I call like my hunter, my predator that should be like, cool, like, where's the opportunity here? Like, where can I, where can I insert myself? If I was going to enroll this person, how would I do it? What is the leverage point? Where, where is this person stuck? Like, where is my entryway? That part of me would be present, not like, uh, you know, sign up for my thing, right? Not scary, but it would definitely be there. And so um, I would, I would do the same thing. I would go to events. I would, I would just get in conversations with people, ask lots of questions, be really interested and find out what's going on for them. And you know, just, just invite people into coaching conversations. Like, that's it. I would just say, Hey, would you like some, would you like some help with that? Which is a simple magic word. And, um, I would just start, just start filling my calendar with coaching conversations. Um, it's interesting. I've been reflecting a lot on like where I am at my life, my business. And there's a part of me, it's like, man, I, I miss the simplicity of the early days of being a coach. I like, that's it. You know, like you don't have a niche. You don't really know who you are. And you're just like kind of going out there and figuring out now it's like, well, do I work on marketing for this thing? Or do I write this book? Like, you know, things have gotten so much more complicated in my business and my life. And I've only been doing this for a few years, but um, when what, there's a part of me that like wants to like all the new coaches just be like, oh God, you assholes, you're so fucking lucky. And you don't realize it, <laughs> that it's so simple, right? It's actually so simple because you don't have to decide a lot of things about your business right now. All the things you're freaking about that you don't know are an incredible amount of freedom that like you can just go out and discover your clients, discover who you love to coach and just serve, serve, serve and do the most fun parts. And I wish I could go back and tell myself when I first started coaching to just savor it because I don't know that the, it's, it's the, the fear makes it really awful in a way, but the discovery is just so rich and delicious. I I think I would add, like, I think I do have that same agenda you do. Like I'm, cause I'm so fascinated by people's possibility, like what's available for this person and what's the pain they're feeling because the pain also represents possibility. So I think if, if I appreciate you saying that Toku, because it helps me see, like, I think I am looking for that. My game is to not look for it so as to get them somewhere, but to look for it because that's my fascination and my fascination naturally leads into me being coach. So it, they, they do go together, but I love that you articulated that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there, there's a real, uh, the, the reason why, there's two reasons why I mentioned it. One is that I find that people are going, well, if I have any agenda, I just shouldn't talk to them. Yeah. I'm like, you know, come on, you're not, you know, you're not the Dalai Lama. Every human the Dalai has Lama. an agenda. 
Yes, we all have agendas, right? The problem is mm-hmm. when we keep that agenda hidden and weird. I mean, you know, I, yeah. I, I'll tell people, like, you know, I, at the beginning of this thing, I said, hey, we're doing this thing to be of service and we have coaching programs we think are really awesome. We'd like you to sign up for them. That's, I mean, that is part of our agenda, right? This is Facebook. We're doing marketing right now, but yeah. it doesn't feel like marketing because we're not being jerks about it and we're not being weird <laughs> and trying to pressure you. We're like, look, we think we've got something amazing. We want to serve you. And if you like this, we'd love to serve you more. And so that's why I'm just like, let go of this idea that you need to not have an agenda. And like that part of you that you think is all icky and weird. that's like, well, but I want them to, I, there's a part of me wants them to sign up. That part of you is really important and amazing. Like it, go watch a nature video of like a lion or a wolf stalking an animal and forget the fact that the deer is cute and you feel bad for it. Like that part of ourselves, that's the predator is like so amazing and cool. And it does so many amazing things and just sense it's so sensitive and careful. Like, don't cut that part off yourself. It's, you're going to be awful at building your business, but you're going to be a bad coach too. No one wants a coach that's afraid to be a bit of a predator. Mm-hmm. Cool. cool. Are we, is it serious time question now? Uh, well, do you have another you have a question from the document? I sure do. Guys, I'm going to reference All the right. document here. The document. Let me just load up the document. Okay. This is from the Model United Coaching Student. Sometimes I wonder if I'm being as effective as I could be in creating change. So I'm curious which thought models slash philosophies and tools have you come across so far that you find are the most powerful for creating change? Okay, I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to sort of give it up onto the screen there. Um, Me first or you first, Toku? Uh, I think I went first last time. No, no, you went first last time. It's my turn to go first. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so what models are the most helpful for creating change? Man, I don't know why I put this question there. It's a hard question. It's a big question. Um, all right. So well, I really like uh, family systems theory as a model for creating change. I, I find it really interesting to look at like, what is the childhood patterning and belonging that we use? Um, and probably the, if, you know, that's a huge subject matter, but the one thing that I've really like hit on, which I think is really interesting, which I think is a big, it's a mistake I think coaches make or a blind spot is that we, we tell our clients they should never feel guilty. And my understanding of studying family systems theory is that guilt is actually just like the speed limit of belonging. So when we feel guilty, we violated the belonging or the rules we were raised with and um, we're changing. And so I would say if your clients, if you're like trying your clients to never feel guilty, you basically said like, well, break the, we want you to get out of the, the solar, out of the atmosphere, but don't feel the effects of gravity. I'm like, dude, not going to work. And so um, to me, that's one of the most valuable tools. When my client says, hey, I'm feeling guilty. I'm like, awesome. You feel great, guilty. Great. What's happening? What rules about yourself are you violating? Can you lean through that guilt in a way that feels good? Like, can you discern for yourself what guilt is holding you back? and is like um, not is sort of just a, based on the universe you were raised in and what guilt is actually an indication of the moral stance you're taking in the world and discerning those two. And so I, I think that that's an incredible change model. Um, I have primarily studied it through a, a school called uh, uh, an NLP Marin. I'm a huge NLP guy, but I love transformational NLP. And they, they teach all about family systems theory and in relationship to uh, change work. I just think it's an incredible place. So that's my very academic answer. Uh, I will speak to context first, and then I'll answer the content of the question. So the context around this I'm hearing is a little bit like, I'm afraid I'm not creating change. Maybe if I had different thought models or philosophies or tools, then I could feel comfortable or safe or good or know on some level that I'm doing the best I can to create change. And that can be a bit of a slippery slope. So uh, mine, Toku, like that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was, to, I was trying to text. I'm just going to go do it. I'll be right oh. back. <laughs> okay. I have to go turn my chargers. I thought I was texting Christina. I just texted Adam. <laughs> hey, can you turn the hall light on? And he's like, why are you, why are you texting me? And I thought I was texting Christina because she's in the condo at the beach and my charger's not working because the hall light's not on. So I'm just going to go turn it on. Not all plans, I'll guys. Be back. <laughs> so so uh, there is a... All models are broken in the sense that it's like to have a model is inherently self-limiting because life is infinite and abundant. And just like any belief, 
is inherently self-limiting, including the one I just put forth, that every belief is inherently self-limiting. So um, one of the things I've noticed with my own work is I brought this to my coach a while back, like, ah, it's really challenging. One of my clients isn't moving forward. And where she invited me to look was to notice how I have a story about how things must look for them to be moving forward. And sometimes stuff can be just jammed up, stuck here for six weeks and not seven, but six weeks at least and still be moving forward. And so that's the first thing is I would just caution the Model United coaching student about falling down the trap of like, I need the right model or if I just got a different model or something like that. And I think probably much more powerful might be to really get coached around your relationship to your client moving forward and creating change. Because sometimes what will best serve our clients is for us to be the only people in their lives that are like totally fine with them just fucking around for four months. I had one client, he hired me for a year and he did nothing for 10 months. He paid a lot of money to do nothing for 10 months. He was right on the verge of the breakthrough but, and then he quit. So that's a different conversation. But like that actually was his process was to do like not really do that much to have it continually reflected to him like, hey, is this really how you want it to go? And then you get defensive and, and we'd go through that. He was right up against that point where he was unwilling to continue to be with nothing changing. Unfortunately, the way he saw to create the change was just to end the coaching because that, that allowed him to stop being confronted with it. So sometimes it's not a model you need. It's just being willing to let your client be there. Mm. Now to the content. Can I do, like, can I, can yeah, I, meta, can I do a yeah. meta thing? So I there. just want to point out kind of something interesting that happened, which is that so I answered the question very much in the context the client gave, and Adam did this really beautiful thing, which he created a context bigger than the question, right? And this is actually going to show up all the time with clients, is that they're going to ask a question, and your immediate response is, great, that context is fine. I'll just go with that, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, there's, no, there's nothing wrong. I'm not like, oh, God, I'm a horrible, you know, I, I answered the question. I think that's a good model, and right? So that's fine. And there's something really interesting that happens when you answer the question from a context greater than itself. And so I just, it was just such a beautiful modeling of two ways to answer the same question. And again, no right or wrong way to do it, but looking at, okay, in what situations is it easier for me to say, great, that context makes sense. Here's my response. And when do I say, hmm, the context itself of the question is limited. How do I create a larger context to answer it? So that when I answer the question, I'm answering the question of the client's possibility, not just the you know, sustainability or the sort of survival mechanism or the limitation of how they're showing up today. Mm. Now I will go and answer <laughs> from that place and I'll do it quickly, which is the model that I've found most powerful is uh, the ontological model, which is basically that there's a fundamental nature to each human being, a fundamental greatness. And, um, and then there's all the stuff we layer on top of that for reasons like who I am is not enough. I need to be seen. I need to be loved. I have to do this in order to be loved. It's not acceptable for me to be as connected as I am, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so from that starting point, there is everything can happen. And all you're really doing is helping people distinguish between, it goes back to our first question, the fear-based part and the love-based part and helping them choose back into this one, assuming that they want to. So I, I love that model. The annoying thing about an ontological approach to coaching is that 90% of the work is always yours. And so every time your client's driving you nuts or not moving forward fast enough or not whatever, the conversation you end up in with your coach is like, great, what can you see in yourself? How can you own this? And then there's certainly what to do to move forward. But I just think that's a really powerful approach to take as a coach. I love that. I love that. I really want to answer Katie's question. Yeah, do you have question right comment. Let's do it. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, bam. And guys, keep them coming. We love your questions. Look, you get your 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 uh, photo shown up here, your name. Katie, you're famous, as is Harry now. So um, Katie asks, how many questions, how many coaches are we allowed at once? So one, the simple answer is infinite. Two, what I see most people do is they have multiple coaches and what that does is it allows them to avoid the intimacy that comes from a really, really, really deep coaching relationship. And what they do is they play those coaches off of each other and say, well, this person said this, but I don't like it. So and they bring it to another coach instead of bringing it back to the same coach and going deeper. And they 
silo their life as though like who they show up as in business is different than who they show up as in romance, as in sex, as in whatever. And so I'm not saying like I have, I just hired someone to support me around nutrition and he calls himself a nutrition coach, but I have one coach to rule them all who is my one-on-one deep, 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 deep ontological coach. And everything goes through her. She is kind of like the person probably closest to me than anyone else in the world with the exception of maybe my wife. But even so, like I share stuff with that coach that I wouldn't share with my wife quite the same way. So I think you can have as many as you want and really like make sure you've got that one really powerful relationship that's serving you if you're really committed to this work. Yeah, I I guess the place I would look is that if you are working with a really, really good coach and really working with it, you probably don't have space for a lot of other coaches, Mm. right? I think it's actually a really good place to look. But if your coach is really, really has you on your edge, like there shouldn't be a lot of space. Now you can work with a a consultant or a coach consultant, right? On something that's very like subject matter. Like my nutrition coach consultant. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, or you can work with like, like we've worked with business coaches that are basically like they're, you know, they're kind of doing some coaching, but they're really holding the space for our business. They have expertise in business and that's really helpful. And so, you know, you can hire people to do that. But again, if you are working with a really, really, truly good masterful coach and you are really fully engaged in that work, you probably don't have space for a lot else. And that's in my experience. And when I'm working with when I'm working with a coach and I'm fully engaged, like there's just not space because I'm just doing that work full time. It's got me on my edge. It's got my stuff up. I'm challenged. And then when that start, relationship starts to fade, one of my signs that kind of like, I need to start looking for another coach is I start to hire other coaches, right. To kind of supplement different parts. I'm like, ah, that's my time. Like, okay, I need to look for that next person, that next coach. That's going to be, going to be the guy, going to be the mentor. So hire as many coaches as you want. But to me, like when we hire lots of coaches, it's usually because we just aren't really willing to either invest fully into that one coach, or we haven't really found a coach that can really just like get us and, and, and push us. Yeah. Yeah. You and I both, I mean, if we've had conversations like this, like it is, it's pervasive, right? Like you're being coached in your being and you can't separate your being. It doesn't matter. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I just uh, want to say one thing, which is that, um, a Small group programs are great. We both run small group programs. They're amazing. You get amazing coaching from it. Small group programs are not a replacement for a one-on-one coach. No. Oh, I, I, I'm gonna, instead of do, hiring a one-on-one coach, I'm just going to do the small group program. It's, it's a nice bridge. I'm not saying don't do small group programs, but like literally nothing has changed my life more powerfully or exponentially than the two, the two one-on-one coaches I've worked with, the last one and the one I'm working with now. Um, a guy named Jeff Riddle and a guy named Hans Philip, who um, Adam recommended me to. Just, I mean, the group programs are great, but exponentially more powerful working with those two incredible coaches. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can pay this, you can pay some margin of what you would pay to hire a really great one-on-one coach and you can get some margin of the results. Not like small group coaching is better than doing nothing, better than like, you know, sticking your thumb up your butt and clucking like a chicken, but it's not, the, not where that came from. Depending on your um, sex life. <laughs> Um, but it's not the same as hiring a one-on-one coach. So do small group programs, but find a way to get supported by a one-on-one coach. Uh, we've got some good quickies here. One is I love reading books about coaching, but there are so many of them. Can you share what books you're reading and, um, how you apply what you've read to your coaching? Do you think we can make this a quick answer? Yeah, I can do it. We'll we'll just pick one. Um, so the book that I'm currently reading that I'm starting to bring in my coaching is a book called multipliers. It's all about leadership. Um, it's discerning the difference between diminishers who are so smart that they diminish people around them um, and multipliers, people who make the people around them smarter. And the way that I mostly bring stuff I read in is I use it on myself. I like apply the book to my, I take notes, I apply it to myself. I figure out how can I integrate it into my practice and I apply those practices. And then as I start to get familiar with it, I bring it into my clients. I'm not afraid to bring it into my clients as I'm still practicing myself, but I'm just clear like, Hey, this is a new thing. I'm practicing this. I'm not an expert at it yet, but I think this might be valuable and and share it with them. So that's, that's my book right now. 
Uh, I'll speak to one of the earlier books I read, which was a book is a book called Getting Real by Susan Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L, which is an amazing book, really just about how to be authentic, which was mm. a big edge for me and, and kind of is part of my dharma. It's always like, how can I be more authentic? And um, so I recommend that to lots of people. It's great. How do I bring that into my coaching? I don't, I don't read books these days um, with the end in mind of how am I going to apply this in my coaching? Because my agenda for my coaching tends to be over there with the client. And if I read a book through that lens, then it, it creates like a bit of a filter for what gifts I can get from the book. Because I'm like, well, how is this applied? How do I get this? How does this benefit my client? What I notice is that when I read a book just from interest and because it's in a subject matter that I'm interested in, which tends to be coaching, I start to see stuff in my own life. And then as I start to see stuff in my own life, I can start to see it over there with my clients. But almost very rarely does it go in the other order. Like I can see the surface with my clients, but usually I have to see the depth of it with myself before I can see the depth of it with my clients. Yeah. Cool. Any uh, questions in the comments or? Let's have a quick look. Uh, Jason VS says, great answer, Adam. So that's a good question. I like that one. Excellent. Keep that coming, Jason. Sorry, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Jason. I apologize. <laughs> Aaron Caulfield says, I'm going to coach six or so leaders in one organization. What are your guys' thoughts on how to coach multiple leaders in one organization? And then he's got a bit of elaboration, which is any specific agreements around confidentiality? Do you guys have any stories? What worked well? What mistakes did you make? Insights. So I say we kind of don't dive too deep into the content of those questions, but maybe offer a high level approach? Yeah. I guess my first question would be, how is it any different than coaching anyone else in any other situation? Yeah. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> the, here's, what, here's what I would add. And then you can jump in more if you've got more Toku. But um, to your point, like, just like a human being has an essence and then a survival mechanism or a fundamental greatness and then a fear-based stuff, so too does an organization. You put any group of people together and you'll start to feel and see like, oh, there's an essential brilliance or love or wisdom or whatever present with this group of people. And there's a, a fundamental or not fundamental, but like a fear-based kind of condescension to them or time context or being saccharine sweet with love and never willing to say the honest thing with each other or whatever it happens to be. So I really wouldn't coach it that much different. And what I would say is that um, it helps to have a partner when you're taking on groups of people because groups will fear begets more fear. So if one person is reacting from their fear, that'll drive up the other people's fear. And then before you know it, you've got six scared survival mechanisms coming at you. And that's a lot to sort of deal with. And having a partner can give you, sometimes people can better hear another person. So it just makes it a lot easier to play. You don't get drawn down into the weeds so much. So those are kind of the, just the, the couple of things that I would provide as a quick answer to this. I think that the only other thing I might say is don't necessarily fall victim to the idea that confidentiality with multiple people in a company needs to be the same as regular confidentiality. So I've coached couples before and I've been really clear, like, I'm not going to share what one person says to the other person. And if you tell me, I don't want you to tell this other person the thing. Great. But I'm not going to pretend like I've not talked to the other person at all. Like I'm going to use the information from your colleagues to help support you and then find out well, what fear comes up when I say that. Because they're going to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm worried this person or I'm worried you're going to tell this person that and then create some agreements around this thing particularly. So don't pretend like, you know, I think the mistake I see coaches make is pretend like each coaching relationship is truly individual. They know you're talking to their, their colleagues. They know you have that knowledge. So just be upfront about it and own it and create agreements around that that makes sense. But have the conversation. Nice. Uh, I got two quickies from the document. You ready? Okay, let's do it. So the first is, are you ever worried that your coach is struggling in coaching you? Then you help your coach coach you. I'll go first. So constantly, always amazed at how my coach has the capacity to be with any of my bullshit. And um, these days, I don't try to help her. Instead, if I noticed that I was trying to help her, I'd just bring that. I'd be like, hey, I noticed I'm afraid that you're struggling to coach me. And I'm trying to help you a little bit. And then we would go from there, wherever there was to go from there. 
my answer. Um, I'm pretty new in a coaching, my coaching relationship. So I'm still in that honeymoon phase where I still think like my coach is always like, I don't know all his tricks yet. And so I'm still enamored. So, uh, which by the way, totally happens in coaching relationships. If you don't think it does, you're just delusional. Um, and then, and then sometimes when that gets broken, it is, whew, it is a thing. So, uh, they have a term for it in therapy called projection and counter projection. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, that's not been something I've been particularly concerned about. And like you, Adam, I would just, I would just bring it. Um, I would look on your, you know, bring to your coach, but I would look on your side as client and say, you know, what, what is your relationship to helping other people or what is your relationship to what, what is your obligation when you are struggling and other people are supporting you? Like what shows up for you there? Um, ideally your coach would ask you those questions, but that would be the place I look. Cause for me, a lot of it is when that kind of stuff shows up, it's I'm putting conditions on other people supporting me, which is sort of a, it's a little subtle desire to control. And so that's just a great place to look. How can I surrender more deeply to the coaching? Yeah. It's basically you being uncomfortable with someone struggling. Your yeah. job is to be comfortable with that. Let someone struggle. Yeah. Okay. Here's All our right. last one. This was from last time okay. and we got time. Do you have to yeah. cut right at the hour? No, I'm good. Great. Okay. I got a few more minutes. Um, have you ever had a client who keeps saying one thing and then doing another? Like they say they're clear on something, but then keep going back to it and stirring it up. How do you call that out lovingly? Um, do we have a, I can go we first. don't have a clever name. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we don't have a clever name. We're going to call this one, um, signed, um, the route, the, the carousel coach. Nice. Love it. Yeah. All right. In, in the moment here. Um, uh, yeah, that's what clients do all the time. That's why they hired you. So, uh, that's super normal, right? It's, uh, I declaring, I want to be done and not being done. So, I mean, I think you just say like, Hey, I'm noticing this thing that you're doing. I'm really curious. What do you, what do you notice about that? And then be ready for their defensiveness to come up because it likely will. What are you talking about? You know, so I, I don't think you do it necessarily anything else. And um, I guess the piece that I would look here for as coach is like, where are you not getting complete on your client being in the struggle, right? Where are you getting a task of them being kind of done with the thing, right? Like, well, they said they were done. Like they should just stop it already. You know, it's like that uh, Bob Newhart sketch on SNL where he just tells people to quit. You know, I'm, I think too much about my ex-girlfriend. I just quit it. Right. So it's like that. Right. And um so I, I think as coach, notice where you're attached to them being resolved. And instead, like, how can you just lovingly hold up the mirror every time when that shows up and every time, and this is the part, this is actually the really difficult sort of emotional, spiritual practice of coach. Every time hold the possibility that this might be the time that they see it and go, wow, you're right. Even when you're like, they have, because your client will enroll you in this idea that that is never going to work. They're like, man, they will fight you tooth and nail that this will not, and they will try to convince you that it's not working, that the coaching isn't working, that it's your fault, that it's their fault, that it's the unit. Like they are just, that survival mechanism is tricky. So just your job, your spiritual practice as coaches, just with full of hope, hey, I love you. I noticed this thing is here. Is, is today the day you want to take a look at it? That's it. And, and even if they never change, even if they die that way, to hold that possibility. That's the, that's the job of coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. I agree with everything you said there. I love that bit too, about holding the possibility that like, maybe this is when they push past it. And I think the only thing I would probably add is, so one, your job is just to keep reflecting to it, but being attached to how they receive it. So it's just like you're pointing to it, just like your mirror reflects to you how your outfit looks and doesn't care whether you're like, fuck you, mirror. You can't tell me my tie looks bad with this shirt. And it's just like, well, that's what it looks like. So reflect to them. And then if you notice a pattern in how it goes when you reflect things, now you're now you create ev elevation on that. So like it might go from pointing to like, hey, I notice you're doing one thing and you're saying another. Is that how you want it to go? No, I'm not. Great. All right, cool. Let's drop it. Next week, you do the same thing. Next week, you do the same thing and they react the same way. Now, the conversation might become like, hey, I noticed something. I've reflected something to you three times in a row. And each time you've gotten defensive 
And I assert you're still doing that same thing that you're defensive about. It, are you noticing that defensive reaction? How is that going? Is that how you want the coaching to go? And is there some way you're relating to me in the reflection I'm giving you that has you feeling defensive? So you're always like, this is the challenge is we're always getting up above the level that the client's playing at so we can provide them elevation. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll bring the same fight up here and then you have to get up to the next level and then the next level. All of that is impossible if you are fixated on your client shifting or things going a certain way, because that puts you right down here with where your client's at. So in fact, it's great. They're, they're saying that they're going to do one thing and they're not. And this is exactly why everything in their life is exactly the way it is. This is the thing that's in the way. So the gift is like, so cool. They're showing up in the coaching the same way they show up in the rest of their lives. That is the requirement of client. They are doing their job celebrate them and then reflect lovingly to them what's going on and then be unattached to how it goes. Yeah. I think when I, when I first started coaching, I was really happy when my clients got results. And then I was happy when my clients were like struggling, but kind of like enjoying or excited about the struggle. And now I'm like, I actually get most excited when things just get awful with my clients. When it's mm. like, they're like, I can't, I can't do this. It isn't working. I have, I have no hope. Cause I'm like, Oh I man, I'm like, I hate you. Like, I'm like, this is it. Like, this is the, yeah. you know, cause they think we kind of think we're like, Oh, well I know in the past when I've changed, it's been really hard and I've wanted to quit and I felt hopeless, but this time it's going to be different. This time I'm going to make a big change and there's going to be no problems. And that's just not true. Right. So, but you know that they may not be aware of that in the moment. And so when the big problems show up, you're like, great. You're actually on the cusp of something amazing. Yeah, you and come then, to love the breakdowns. They, yeah. they don't necessarily, they still drive your stuff up, but you come to be able to, again, create that altitude in the face of your stuff being driven up to be like, oh, cool, we're here, finally. Yeah. The last thing I'll, I kind of want to say about this is um, that as you're working with them, it is okay if you're having like, man, I'm really just like sick of them just saying the same thing. I'm not saying do this all the time, bring your judgment. You might just say like, hey, I noticed that like, I keep bringing this to you. You keep showing up just it. And I'm getting really, I feel like I've noticed I'm getting sick of it. And that's my work. But like, I'm curious, like, is there any part of you that's getting sick of this? Like what shows up? Because honestly, like if you're sick of it, probably everybody in their life is sick of it, but no one in their life is going to be able to have the container and the safety to say, hey, people around you might be sick of it. They may not, they might not be interested at all in that reflection. But I do think there is a time and a place to share, like, sometimes the most powerful things I've said to clients, like, look, I'm just, I'm really bored right now. And I'm really tired of hearing this. And like, it's okay if it's me. And if I need to take a break, I'm fine with that. But I just wanted to share that's what's up with me. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Chrissy, cool. thanks for your question. We unfortunately do not have time because I've got a call starting soon and probably Toku does too. But we will carry that forward to our next Dear Sensei when we do that. Right, Toku? Yeah. Yes, we will. So we'll, we'll announce that. We'll put that out on Facebook. Um, tell us about uh, the Samurai Coaching Dojo. Cool. So uh, the Samurai Coaching Dojo, what to say about it? So basically, the way that we created the Samurai Coaching Dojo is we kept going to coaching intensives and being like, coaches aren't, these, are, these coaches around us aren't making any money. They aren't, we're doing the same thing they are and we're like making a bunch of money and they're not doing it. What's up with that? And then we went kind of figured out like, well, why, why are we being successful and they aren't? And we basically deconstructed what we did as coaches. You know, in 18 months, I was a six figure coach. And it's not because like I'm way better than other coaches or like I'm way more talented or I'm like naturally gifted as a coach. It's because of this methodology that I had personally developed to practice and develop my skills and abilities. So we took all of that stuff and then we learned even more stuff. And we put in this thing called the coaching dojo. And so basically what we do is it's, um, like, you know, 10 years of coach training in six weeks. It's like 10 years of transformative work in six weeks. It's like all of the things that all the other programs promise to be, it actually is. And the reason why is we actually have stripped away all of the crap that's a distraction. And we just have you look directly at the thing that matters as coach. We have you practice. We have you show up, be coach, get coaching, get feedback. And we just, it's one of those spaces that Adam, let's talk about. Where we're just going to tell you the truth about who you are, how you're showing up and how you're showing up as a coach. And so it's not for everyone. It's not for, you know, um, but whether you're a new coach or really experienced, we'd love to have that conversation with you if you're interested. So we have a coaching dojo available right now. One is sold out, but we have one more that's still open. And we have one group of the sales dojo that's still available. And we bring that same practice 
mentality to both the coaching dojo and the sales dojo. So if you want to up your game in sales, you want to resolve this question of like, am I good at coaching? Like I used to like doing it, but now I'm bored. You know, I God, what happened to my love of coaching? Uh, I really want to be pushed and challenged. I haven't been challenged in years. Clients don't challenge me. Coaches don't challenge me. If you're that kind of person, that tough nut to crack, man, we'd love to crack your nuts. Bring them here. <laughs> man, that's an amazing uh, sales coffee you just wrote. <laughs> um, six Adam, weeks can, can in you, duration. You, uh, excuse me? Seven, right? Seven weeks in Seven duration? Weeks, yes. It's uh, three weeks, a week of integration, and then another three weeks. And you guys start... We start uh, in the beginning of the second week, uh, first week of September. So regular decision for applications close soon. So if you're, th- you're just thinking about it, go ahead and do an application. If it's a no, we'll have a conversation. If it's no right now, we'll put you on a list for next time. That's fine. Um, or just shoot me a message. Ask me a question. So, you know, we're happy to talk to people about it. We want people to commit to practice, whether or not they do it in the dojo or someplace else. Adam, I heard you have a really cool thing called Forging the Steel. Would you tell us about that? Oh, it's such a coincidence. I was just thinking that I should say something about it. (laughs) So Forging the Steel is a longer form group, um, whereas the Samurai Coaching Dojo is six weeks of very intense practice. Forging the Steel is six months. And um, our focus is on three things. First is the being of the coach, which is a lot of the context stuff we've been talking about here. Second is the actual doing of building a thriving coaching practice, because all of the work in the world to develop your being is irrelevant if you're a coach and you can't make good money doing this. It just means that the work isn't sustainable, the work dies with you, and that sucks. And then third is actually um, developing mastery on your ability to work as a coach, the kind of questions you're asking, how you're bringing that being to the conversation with the person, who you're showing up as with the, the person, and the kind of like inquiry that you're in with them. So we're really trying to create an opportunity for coaches to work at all three of these levels, which we really think are imperative to be a masterful coach. And to your point, Toku, about um, a lot of training falling flat, it's, I think, because they operate at one of these three levels. They, They don't integrate any of, like, they don't give you all of this. And so you learn like the surface level of asking just the right questions, but who cares because who you're being is attached to how your client shows up and it just gets in the way of really unfolding people. So um, do I want to say anything else about it? Um, It's amazing. You should do it. If you're a coach of any level, we promise that we will create shifts and absolutely breakthroughs and transformation for you. That is our highest commitment. Yeah. Starts okay. September 5th is the first call. We have a bonus call for anyone that signs up before the end of this week. So that one's fast approaching and we have two spots remaining. Can you tell us a little bit like some of like what I, I you guys posted recently, like a testimony or some of the results, like what, what has been your experience of people who kind of go through the program? Like what, like what happens to them? Yeah. So people usually come in thinking this is the thing I need to work on. And often they're 50% right, right? They're right on some level, but the approach that they're trying to take or whatever is what's getting in the way. And usually what happens, like the process people go through is first kind of confronting the, like actually getting brought present to the thing that's really in the way, to the story or the pattern that they're running that they can't see. Then usually a period of what we would call breakdown, not crying, sobbing in tears, nervous, whatever, but just like, wow, things aren't working the way they should. And then usually that is a couple of months. And then on the other side of that is the breakthrough where everything starts to shift. Their circumstances Mm -hmm. haven't changed, but who they're being completely shifts. Mm -hmm. And then on that side of the equation is usually when they start to see a pickup in their, um, their enrollment in the, just the depth of coaching that they're doing. And honestly, also their referrals because their clients are starting to experience something different than they were before. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I think there's a real value in having that longer container for that sort of like slow. I love that you guys are doing because it's a nice long container for that kind of slow cook. It's like putting something in a crock pot, right? Like to some certain things taste really good in a crock pot. And I also love that like, there's an aspect of, I mean, we actually looked at doing the dojo as a longer program and we, we, so it was longer and we shortened it. And part of it was Mm -hmm. that my experience of Zen training was that Living at the monastery had real value, but there was a once a month we had these intensive retreats. There was a week of like a really tight container, really intense focus practice. And to me, those were always the highlights of my training. And so we really created the dojo to be like that 
like going on a Zen retreat, that intensive feeling where you're a lot's happening. And then for months and months after it's really blossoming. And I think that they're both like, it's like, I would tell people like daily practice, long-term practice is essential and retreat practice is essential. So I love that you guys are doing it because it feels like we're attacking the same problem from two different perspectives, intense retreat practice and the sort of more long-term daily practice perspective. So do both, yeah. do one this year, do the other next year. Just do it all, man. Do it. Don't do them at the same time, probably. I'm not sure I would recommend that, but do them both. Um, Priyanka, Chrissy, we see your questions. We'll bring those forward. Um, just checking if there's anything I want to say in parting. Uh, just thanks for being here, guys. Um, if you're a coach and you're on this conversation, I and Toku, I'll speak for him. We appreciate you because there is a lot more coaches that are just sitting there saying, I don't need to do my craft. I took my training. I've got that in the bag. Thanks for not being one of those coaches. Thanks for being committed to mastery. Oh, thank you, brother. Anything you want to add or no, nope, I'll hit that you in. Said it, you said it perfectly, Go. man. What am I going to, um, don't, uh, oh, okay. I, I know what to finish with. The opposite of lukewarm should be Vader cold. <laughs> Hope that helps you guys. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> See you soon. <laughs>